Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Becoming You podcast. I am so excited to have a guest interview for you today. I am here with Barry Tesler. Barry is someone that I have followed for a couple of years because of her work around money. And we're going to dig deep into money today. So Barry has a master's in somatic psychology. She is a financial therapist and is the founder of The Art of Money, which is a year-long money school. I love her work because she blends financial literacy with emotional literacy and body-centered work. She's a pioneer in the field of financial literacy and has also authored a book called The Art of Money, A Life-Changing Guide to Financial Happiness. She's been featured on Oprah.com, Inc.com, US News and World Report, USA Times. I could keep going on and on. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, but she is really, really good at what she does. So Barry, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Visa. It's a pleasure. It's kind of a dream that I'm talking to you just because I followed you from afar and I've like just been so impressed with all your work. Um, so first of all, let's start with your story. And I would love to hear about what got you started in this work. We all have an origin story, right? As to why we are doing the work we're here to do in this lifetime. Um, yeah. What drives you? Why are you so passionate about this? Yeah, well, this work really surprised me. I never knew that I would be doing financial therapy work, right? That that wasn't the topic. Money and finances weren't my topic, right? So when I started graduate school at the age of 24, um, but I need to back up a little bit because my origin story is that I grew up in Chicago um, with a middle class family. My family is Jewish and all my grandparents escaped their home countries of Russia, which now is Ukraine and Belarus and Lithuania. And they all escaped because we're Jewish and my they, you know, wound up in Chicago. And um, so I grew up middle class with my family owning some buildings or managing buildings. And then they owned some bars with my uncles and, um, right. So that, that's a little bit, right, about family of origin, right? So growing up, I either wanted to be a dancer, um, number one. Number two, I wanted to be a businesswoman because my dad was in business. So I wrote my seventh grade report, career report, and I want to be a businesswoman. I don't know what kind, but, you know, some kind of businesswoman. And then at age 16, I asked my parents if I could go to therapy. I wanted to understand myself better. And so I fell in love with psychology and going deeper into ourselves. And I feel as though at some point I combined being a dancer, someone who loved movement, with being a businesswoman, <laughs> with being, you know, a therapist. And, you know, I wound up as I said, at the age of 24 in graduate school st to study somatic psychology. Somatic psychology just means body, ma money, mind and body are connected, right? And I'm watching you, whoever I'm working with, for what are your gestures? What is your body doing? What is your facial expressions doing? And I don't know what they mean, but I'll invite you into your body, right? So what's going on? in your shoulders right now. Just let yourself notice, right? So really in my 20s, in graduate school, my internships, uh, you know, I my topics were sexuality, intimacy, body, food, grief, and death. There's no money in there, right? Oh. Or finances or financial literacy. And so for me, what happened was when I graduated and that student loan came due, that was my like epiphany moment of, wait a second, I went to graduate school to train to be a therapist. We studied every topic under the sun, beyond the sun. We never talked about money. So how am I supposed to understand my own money emotions, my own money story? How do I help clients and my couples not fight about money with their partners? How do I start a private practice, you know, and learn bookkeeping and price my fees and services? And I just, I just was like in shock that this was completely left out. So I either was going to, you know, run away uh, from this huge topic or I was going to face it like I did every other really big, scary topic in my life. I decided to face it. And first stop was learning bookkeeping and then having a bookkeeping business for other therapists and artists. And I learned so much about people's earning and spending and values just by doing their bookkeeping, right? They, they, most of them didn't even know I had a master's in psychology, right? 
and that was a great little interim. And then in 2001, it was time to put all of my previous training as a therapist together with all of these practical money management tools that I was falling in love with. And I started my first financial therapy method. And I started teaching it in tiny little groups of 10 people and that grew to 20 people and that grew to 50 people and that grew to 500 people, you know, in my year long program. And um, that was, you know, 22 to 25 years ago. So here I am. <laughs> that's, wow. that's a little bit. I mean, to end that, just it was such a missing piece that I needed. And then when I started looking around me, everyone that I knew, you know, no matter what class background they came from, no matter what lineage, we all had strengths around money. We all had challenges around money. We all had missing pieces in our financial education. And for me, merging financial literacy and emotional literacy was essential. Yeah, um, I really like the way you design your year-long money school. There are very distinct uh, phases. Yes. And the first phase I know is really about money healing, and then it's about money practices, and then it's about money math. And I was looking at that and I was thinking, you know, a lot of times we are taught just to s jump straight to the money mapping, right? And the way you do money mapping is very different. But when I think of money mapping, I think about, well, you got to have a budget and you got to have this. Like we all go straight to that. Yeah. But it took me a long time to realize that I needed to heal my relationship with money. And even that step back from that, I didn't even know I had a relationship with money. I don't yes. think most people realize that we all have relationships to food, to our bodies, to ourselves, to our money. That was an awakening process for me. And so the work I focus on is what is your relationship with yourself, right? Because that impacts everything. And what you focus on is what is your relationship with money? So can you talk more about why we never taught this? <laughs> well, you've asked so many good questions in there and you've highlighted so many things. I mean, so, you know, in the U.S. and in many parts of the world, I have people coming to my year-long program and now my mentor program for therapists and coaches and financial folks, right, all over the world, right? So we have someone from um, um, Korea right now. We have someone in Australia right now. We have someone in Greece, right? We have people from... So why is this not talked about? I mean, it's one of those big taboos that in many families, you don't talk about it. Again, no matter what economic class you come from. This is tab. This is secret. This is private. We don't talk about this outside of our family, right? The other piece is that we don't we don't learn about money in small increments from grade school on up. Now we learn parts and pieces. I remember an accounting class. That's it. My son in high school is getting a personal finance class, right? But they're not learning about money psychology or the emotions of money or that you know, 90% of our money decisions are based on our emotions, right? So we're getting parts and pieces. So it's not part of our education. That's changing, right? So, I mean, that's a teeny bit. It's just, it's one of the big topics, just like sex has been a big taboo, just like death has been a big taboo, just like race we, is a big, has been a big taboo. And we need to talk about all of those topics and we are, and it's changing. So that's a little bit, right? I want to address though, you know, a lot of other financial coaches, their methodology is you go right to the budgeting or you go right to the learning the bookkeeping system, right? And for me, it is money healing first, and that is so important. It doesn't mean that we complete our money healing and then we're done and we never have any money emotions anymore and we never have curveballs in life that we have to deal with, right? And then we arrive at money practices. That's not how it goes. But... It is very important to do some of that deeper money healing work. So what are the set of emotions that come up for you? Where are they in your body? I, you know, teach a lot of somatic tools of just how to, like you do, sit in your body, feel it, notice it, what's going on, where's your breath in your body? And that all leads to, you know, awareness leads to understanding, leads to shifts and learning more about what our money story is right? The beauty, the pain, the challenges, the strengths. And once we have done some of that money healing work, then we arrive at money practices or money maps. And we're so much more ready, number one, or when we're, we are going to learn a bookkeeping system, we have a freak out or we start hyperventilating. Well, we have some tools on how to work with that. We do a body check-in. You know, we, 
we know how to, we learn how to calm ourselves down. We learn how to pause, take a little break, come back. So we have a lot of tools that we then bring to all the practical parts. And as you were also saying, this last piece is my folks too. It, they are like blown away that this is an area of life. It's a relationship, you know, just like any other big area. And it's important to see it as a relationship. And to honor it, I usually use the metaphor of it's a garden. It's, a, it's one of the big life gardens that needs our care and attention and compassion and love, right? Um, but we don't want to overwater it, but most of us underwater it. Some, uh, some overwater it, you know, um, and pay too much attention to the numbers and our bookkeeping and all of that instead of what's truly deeply important to us and who we are and the rest of our lives, you know, bringing that all in. So that's a little bit of my response to, to, to your comment there. Yeah, I find it really interesting. I was listening to another podcast and it's, it, you know, somebody who coaches couples live on the podcast about their money situation. It's so fascinating. And in that, you know, I was listening to this one couple where they have more than enough to retire and they are close to retirement age. And the guy in the relationship is saying, we don't have enough money to retire. And it's in the millions, you know? Yeah. And I found that fascinating because we all think we'll get to a certain number and I'll feel safe. We think yeah. if only I had that much. And what I realized with, through lived experience is that that number in the bank account, it doesn't matter because you'll hit it and then it still won't feel enough. And then that goalpost will move and it'll move and it'll move. Which then tells you that it's really not about what's going on externally. It's really about how do you feel internally about what's going on. Again. Yes. And yes. that's, again, where the emotions come in, right? Because when our emotions take over, our bodies don't feel safe. And, yes. and so I, I just found it, find it so profound that this missing piece, like, is, is not more talked about. Yes. I mean, for me, it was, it was as soon as I realized I was going to, do some kind of money work, you know, create some kind of methodology. I needed to bring the body or all my somatic training into it. I think the very first class I taught, I went straight to money history and family of origin. And I could just see everyone glazed over and went into kind of shock and fight, flight, freeze. And I was like, whoa, 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 what did I just do? Wait a second, bring my somatic tools. And so I think you, the second class, it was all right, we're going to check in with our body, what's going on on a physical level, sensation level, right, in your breath. And yeah, I've seen it for years. It's not a number and, and it's all relative, right? I mean, yeah, a few million dollars is plenty of money, right? It, uh, it's plenty of money, <laughs> you know? Um, again, we all have different spending habits and values and all of that, but on paper, that's, that's a, a, a huge chunk of money to retire on, right? But in his, his experience, he is, has not been able to locate safety from within. So there may never be a, a dollar amount that's going to give him that, you know? So yes, I'm always trying to support people to tap into, find okayness, find safety, but it's more of a state. It's not this ongoing thing where I feel safe all the time. I don't, or we don't. We go in and out of it. Just like in life, there's ebbs and flows in life and there's ebbs and flows in money. And we can't like set up our lives so perfectly that we're never going to have curveballs or plan so well that things are going to happen. There are things are going to happen, you know? So that's the reality too, you know? And I always tell the story of the um, Janine Ross book, Lost and Found. You know, she tells her own story of how she has been investing in early, her father taught her how to invest very early on. And she invested most of her money with Bernie, Bernie Madoff. And one day she got the call that most of her life savings was gone in an instant. And, you know, she, the whole book is about her finding safety and security separate from the dollar amount in her bank account and that she got some of that money back and had to start over. But really, she talks about her own meditation practices and, you know, finding that within after a huge loss like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to explore more into the topic of how a lot of men and women, but because I, you know, I work especially with women, there's a lot of um, self-worth that's tied to the amount of money you make. Yeah. Yes. And 
I would love for you to give your thoughts on that and how do we start untangling, unraveling that? Because me as an entrepreneur, I have done a lot of healing work, but there is still some attachment to how much is my business bringing in this month? How How is that going to affect how I feel about myself? What did I launch this month, you know? So yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, of, of course it can get confusing, right? Because we think we are our work. We are our work. We love our work, <laughs> but it's also a livelihood, but it's also the amount of money that we make. It's also separate from us, right? I hate the um, coach, the, the, this, the sentiment that's out there of like your net worth equals your self-worth. Self I hate that. Just like you always charge more. There was a time I charged less and made so much more money because it was so much more accessible. And so many more people signed up for my year-long program the very first time I did it, right? So for me, this has come up, this has been a thread that's woven through my work from day one, right? That we do equate our value, our worth with how much money we're making, right? And our value and worth is totally separate from that. It's simply because we were born a unique human, like a unique, beautiful, valuable human. Period. Period. Explanation mark. Explanation yeah. mark. Right? And, and then there is this thing of we do need to charge and we do need to price our services and we do need to create a business model, right? I think this is one of those parts of life where it's, for me, it happens in incremental steps where I'm working on how do I cultivate my self? How do I claim and cultivate my value, my sense of worth? my relationship to that. It's an ongoing journey that I personally have been working on and the way I write and teach about it is also like this happens in small incremental little steps. It could be learning what your yeses and nos are and saying no more and having more boundaries. It could be getting really clear about your personal numbers, you know, and seeing what your family needs or what you need to bring in to contribute and then determining what you want your business to do from that. It could be comparing yourself to someone else in the marketplace, but it doesn't, you know, there's so many different ways. I have like 10 different um, exercises or questions to ask when determining your fees, right? But a few more things. One is that whenever I'm making a decision about business model or my services, it's not just about the numbers. It's also about time and my energy and my family and my health and what phase of life I'm in, right? So, you know, yeah, I'll give two short stories. So back in the day, I wound up um, being invited to, to record like an 11 CD set, you know, before my books came out. I always knew this publishing company was going to contact me. They did. And at the time they were doing like those CD sets. You'd go into a re studio, record on your own. I, I was so excited. I was 38. I was like really healthy. And I just remember the clothes I was wearing. And I was like, ah, you know, so excited. They flew me out to Boulder where I live now. I got in the recording studio. I talked for a few hours by myself. And then after a few hours, I could not talk to myself alone in this recording studio. And it got canceled. The whole thing got canceled within a day or two. I was devastated. I questioned my work. I was like, that's it. I'm shutting it down. You know, I can't do this. I suck. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I, and I, you know, it took me a moment it took my mom. My mom said, Mom, Barry, remember that Loretta Lynn movie? Can't remember the name of it, where she could not sing to a large audience. So they had to turn her around and have her face her kids. Right. And it allowed me to see I'm not good at talking to myself in a room. I need students. I need a group. I need a community. Right. To interact with. Right. To support. I'm a good live therapist. I'm a good live teacher in the moment. Right. And I just realized they didn't set me up for success. I didn't set myself up, you know, so that I would thrive. I wound up learning so much about who I am from my value from that. So that was like, right, that was one story. But, and it wasn't so much about the numbers, that one. But recently, and this is my last story, is that my new mentor program for other financial professionals and therapists, I opened it last year. The first time I opened it, my goal was 20. I wound up getting 40 students. I was like, wow, this is amazing, right? And then the second round, I was like, well, my goal again is 20, but I'll probably get 40 because I got 40, right? And I got 17. And I've learned so much from this. I'm in the second month of this group. Number one, I like the smaller group. I, I, it's so much more intimate, right? And I love it. 
But I was so clear that the results of this weren't about my value or my self-worth. Now, it's taken me years of, you know, of doing the work over and over and over. I know what I do well. I know what I'm not good at. Can I keep fine-tuning? Of course, right? But it was so clear to me that this launch or how it went wasn't about my self-value. It was about the marketplace. It was about what's happening in the economy. It was about, oh, I need to do some more marketing, some more outreach in this particular area, right? Yeah. There's so much freedom that comes from knowing what your values are and the value that you bring, no matter the ego number that we want to make ourselves feel good. Yes. And we all do different projections. My business partner years ago, like 14 years ago, she would always like shoot for the moon. You know, she would always shoot for like the top goal. And I was like, what's our realistic next incremental step? That was my goal. Like I like to grow in small increments and then I like to have a big leap, you know, somewhere along the way, like increment, incremental growth and then leap right? Where someone else, the way they vision, it's like, I'm going for the big thing. But she would be let down sometimes because she wouldn't always hit that bigger goal. So I was always like, what's this interim step that we can get to? So there's so many different layers to this and exercises to do. But I also, just to complete, cultivating, claiming your value is all these small little steps. It could be increasing your pricing. It could be lowering your group pricing so more people are accessible. And then your income goes up. It could be learning to say no to all those tea dates, you know, that you used to say yes to because you need to honor your time more and have more boundaries around that. You, right? There's so many different little steps that we can take to help cultivate our value and self-worth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I grew up in a family where money was used as a manipulative tool for power by my grandparents and my uncles. So I have a really hard time trusting that money is here to support me, right? And um, I would love personally, if, you know, if there is another person listening to this who is also in the same boat, like what are some things that you can share to, you know, how do you start building that trust and to break that pattern from the past of like, money is never here to support me. Money is always pulled out from underneath me, right? Well, interesting. You and I had a similar experience. So I also had a father who could be generous, but also use money as power and control. And they're always strings attached and they weren't always directly communicated what those were. Right. So when I was writing my first book, this is now eight, nine years ago. Right. And so there was a whole chapter on what are the deeper themes that come up around money where it's about money because there are things we didn't learn. And then it's not about money because it's all these deeper themes and, and everything from deeper themes, self-worth, right? To um, enoughness, to responsibility, to um, power, right? So that was my own thing. One of my own things that I had to untangle and on the hook as well. And I think as young folks or teenagers or growing up, even young 20s, we, make de- we may make declarations like, money's not to be trusted or people are not to be trusted, right? And you may have done, you may have made made a declaration and then created different money habits or patterns because of that. What I did was, I'm never going to marry a man. I'm never going to, you know, I need to make my own money or I need to do it differently than how my father did business, right? So there were declarations made and I had to just at some point start recognizing them, realizing I was living them and were they serving me anymore? Right. So just starting to look at my own money stories and patterns. What are we're out of rebellion? What were, you know, what and and really tapping into who am I and how what relationship do I want to have with money or with business? And really truly what are my values? And they're going to be different. Guess what? They're going to be different. Or even if they're same values on the surface, the way we earn and spend and save may be different than our family of origin or even different than our partners today right? So it's a lot of little baby steps. You know, for me, I needed to learn how to make my own money, but it had to be in alignment with my values, right? I couldn't just make money in any way or do business in a way that didn't feel good, right? So there was that. Um, So am I, you know, I, I think I also, so how do you build trust? I think it goes back to these little, little incremental steps unraveling what the money story is, how it was created, honoring the younger parts of us. Yeah. 
know um, of who we were at that time, of course, we reacted that way based on who we are and our personality and the environment, right? And and at some point we need to realize we we get to create our own relationship to money with our own guidelines, right? So I needed to add in rituals when I was doing my money date, light my candles, <laughs> eat my chocolate, you know? My dad would never do something like that. I just had to find my own way. I had to learn a bookkeeping system that made sense to me instead of spreadsheets, right? All these things had to make my own money, had to find a partner that we both had our own money challenges and we wound up growing up together and working on them together instead of, you know, marrying someone who, anyway, there's, there's so many different responses to that. Does that give you a little bit? um, It does. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about your own money rituals and then how can some people, you know, start to create mini rituals just as a starting out point. Yes. Why are they so important? Yeah. So, you know, when I first started looking at my relationship to money, for me, this was scary territory. I wasn't good at math, so I didn't think I'd be able to learn a bookkeeping system. Everyone's different around that. Um, I also thought this area of life was just so boring and dry or there was so much control you know, over, over riding it. Right. So in order to find my own way, I had to bring all the practices that I was learning in graduate school, all these little mini self-care rituals, you know, to bring more meaning, to bring more creativity, to make it more sacred, to make it more playful. And so I just brought in all these other little practices I was doing. So I see this as a self-care practice. And the first thing I came up with was we're going to have money dates and, you know, my, so when I sit down to have a money date, I, as I said, I light my candles, I get out my oils, I get out my water or mocha or chocolate. Some people play music. Some, I like more silence. You just set up your space in a way that it's going to help you cultivate some intentions, a better environment, a better space, right? And then in that practice, when I do a money date, um, I will check in. I will, I will do a body check in. You know, what am I noticing my body? What's going on? Am I, you know, and I do the HALT method, which comes from 12-step programs too. Are you hungry? Are you tired? Are you thirsty, right? Do you need to set a timer? Some people do a money date five minutes a day. Some people do it 15 minutes a day. Some people do it 30 minutes twice a week. There's no one way. There's no right way, right? So when I first started doing money practices, I did them every day for a few minutes because that's what created the habit. That's what created the grooves. That and I, I learned, you know, bookkeeping for me was my entrance way in, you know, I'm not as dogmatic that everyone has to do bookkeeping or learn a bookkeeping system, but it's incredible if you can, and it takes time. You have to be patient. There's a huge learning curve. It takes six months to a year before you feel comfortable and confident. And if you're someone like me, I needed a teacher. I needed someone to hold my hand to show me how to use QuickBooks, right? Where one night my husband just got on Mint. Or quick in and just taught himself in one evening, you know, because he's really tech savvy. That's one option. Or you're like me, you need someone to hold your hand and take breaks along the way, right? But I was doing bookkeeping at the beginning where I'd go out in the world, spend some money, you know, and come home and save, save it, save the little receipts. You know, I don't do that anymore. It's all online. But every few days I would just sit down and say, what came in, what went out, and I would enter it into my QuickBooks. And the mindfulness, you know, the pra- the mindfulness practice, the awareness that I got from my daily spending, these daily moments, you know, all these money moments that were happening daily. I was tracking, I was watching them. It was so helpful. But a money day to simply sit down, set up your space. What is, hey, money, what's going on? What is one next step that I can take right now? Oh, do I need to get some of my, you know, tax information to my accountant? Okay, do I need to hire a new bookkeeping person or trainer to teach me how to do it? Oh, do I just need to go online? I do this every morning. I go online. I look at my, you know, my online banking. I check in with my balances. Does everything look okay? Anything look funny? Any any money leaks happening? Any expenses that don't look right? Let's take care of that right away. It's a little five, 10 minute check-in, right? So money dates are, yeah, you can have your to-do list. And there's always a lot to do. So you go one step at a time, you know, and then you have to keep slowing yourself down. 
And then you notice, you know, some people freak out. They want to just like pay their bills as fast as they can. And, you know, what's going on there? What does it remind you of? Can you slow down? You know, does this remind you of your mom? My, I would remember my mom paying the bills at the dining room table, feeling a lot of tension. I would remember my parents fighting or, right? So, you know, it brings up stuff. So we need to stop and pause and check in during these money date moments. But that's one of my favorite self-care practices. And then, yes, learn a bookkeeping system and start to study your cash flow and patterns and what expenses are not negotiable, you know, and which ones are and add in your values. I have all of these very simple tools that when you practice them are really profound in the money healing section, in the money practices section, in the money map section, as you know. So this is just the beginning, like start having some money dates, set up your space, do whatever would feel good to you. Start saying, hello, money. What do you got? What is one practical step that we need to take? Do we need to get a new person on our financial support team? You know, I have a whole chapter on who are the players and most people have no idea the difference between a bookkeeper, accountant, financial coach, financial planner. So I explain that, offer questions to ask when hiring them and so on. So that's a teeny bit, you know, um, you know, I kind of walk. Yeah, go ahead. I think hearing you talk has helped me reflect on intuitively that I do have something set up in place. Like paying my business credit card creates a lot of tension within me. And so because of that, I used to miss a lot of the payment Yeah, because I would just avoid looking at it. And then, you know, three months, four months, it would like build up this tension within me, this uneasiness. And I'd be like, oh my God, it's like, I got to face it because I don't know what's going on. And then I'd sit down and then I'd feel this intense shame because of all the late charge fees, right? And now you're in even more of a spiral because now not only do you have to pay the credit card, now you have all of these fees on top of that. So there was this moment I decided, okay, there's nothing to feel ashamed about. This is just patterns like repeating itself because of things you've gone through in life. You're just avoiding things that are bringing up painful emotions. And yes. That's okay. So now I've had to set up calendar reminders on my calendar and it will come up, pay credit card bill, right? Like that is an actual <laughs> reminder. And so I'll sit down and like you say, the body, like I will help myself feel grounded. Like I'll make sure my feet are on the floor. And like, how does that feel? I will let my bum sink into the seat because that's comforting because you're like letting your body go, right? And I'll like exhale and then I'll open the bank account and then we will look at the numbers and then I will breathe deep and I'll be like, you can do this. And that's wonderful. I love that. Yes, you just are doing a lot of self-talk. Like, hey, guess what? We all have money, shame. It's okay. Shame's just saying I'm not okay or I don't know how to do this. But guess what? We can learn this and we can make shifts and changes. And it is scary. And I'm going to sit myself down, you know, and I'm going to peek. And I mean, half my people or more are so scared to peek at the numbers. Just sit down. And money dates do need to happen, whether it's daily for a while or weekly or monthly to review, you know, what needs to be paid or how much you're bringing in or how it's going, what's working, what's not. So it becomes more neutral. It doesn't mean it ever like is, you know, there's no emotion, but that's the journey. And getting someone to hold your hand can be really wonderful, you know, in those moments of learning how to read the numbers or understand what's working or what's not, right? Yeah. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how important support is for these aspects of our life. I think so many of us, because we make those declarations early on in our life, I'm going to prove to the world how capable and independent I am. I don't need to rely on anyone. I don't need help. I got this, right? We're out to prove something. And then we end up hurting ourselves in the long run because then we get so overwhelmed, so confused, so stuck. And then it just, and then we refuse to receive the help. And what I'm always telling my clients is it doesn't matter which aspect of your life you're struggling with. Support is actually one of the most healing things for us because we actually feel worthy, right? Because it always comes down to how worthy, how enough do I feel? And we refuse that support. And we don't think we're worthy of it, right? So I'm yes. always like, what's the antidote to that is to let yourself receive it. Right. Or we feel something's really wrong with us that we can't do everything. And guess what? These are specialties. People learn to be an accountant for a long time. People learn to be a finance player for a lot. Like these are different specialties. The therapist needs the therapist. The coach needs the coach. If you're going to 
the gym, you might get a trainer. Like we, we need, there are things we either don't know, like, you know, um, the tax law and code is changing every year. It's good to have someone who specializes in that, right? So there are things that we don't know that we don't have to do on our own. We can get good teachers. And for some of us, some people just really need someone by their side doing this with them. And that's okay too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love for you to share with our community um, as to when is like your next enrollment period is opening up for your year long money program. And then just a brief insight into what that involves. We've already talked a little bit about it. Yes. So we're going to do another opening, another launch in April. It's coming really soon. So I'm, I'm really excited because every year we fine tune, like I'll update the content or last year we changed one of the community support pieces. So we now have a weekly co-working group. So every Saturday, my alumni guides, there's five of them, they host a group where folks come. There can be 10 people on the call. There can be 20 people on the call and they're just taking steps in the program, in the content or they have to fill out some forms for their taxes or there's something in day-to-day -day life. And it's a really beautiful, brave, safe space to just do their own work, right? So um, we're opening in April for a week, April 9th to 16th, year-long program. The content is broken down into 12 modules, four months of money healing, four months of money practices, four months of money maps, wonderful community support every Saturday. Every month I host office hours, so you get me live. If you want to ask me anything about the content and it's a pretty reasonable price point. I know that's all relative, right? Um, so go check that out. You can see very clearly what eat you, what, you know, and all the content is audio and written. So tons of journaling exercises, um, lots of interviews with guest teachers as well. So it's a pretty long sales page, but it's really detailed. It tells you exactly what it is, right? Um, so there's that. And then my mentor program for other therapists and coaches, I'll open up again for in July for an August run. And it's a, that's a four month program for, you know, so folks, you know, professionals have a safe space to do their own money work. They can learn new tools to bring back to their clients and to create healthier, more sustainable businesses and practices. So that's that. And then tons of free content on my blog and podcast. And then my two books go, you know, you can get those anywhere. The first one is the whole methodology, as you know, and the second one is 200 pages of journaling exercises that take you through the three phases as well. Yeah. And what is that one called? It's like the Art of Money Workbook. Oh, okay. the Art of Money Workbook. Yeah. So the first one is the Art of Money, a life-changing guide to financial happiness. The second one is the Art of Money Workbook. Very yeah. simple. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Barry, for being so generous with your time and your expertise and your knowledge. It has been such a pleasure having you on this podcast. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Of course.